So, good morning. Uh, welcome back to the NPTEL course on classics in total synthesis part 1. So, in the last lecture we talked about total synthesis of uh, progesterone uh, a steroid. So, we will continue our discussion today also on uh, total synthesis of steroids particularly uh, progesterone one more total synthesis as well as uh, synthesis of cortisone and so on. Okay. In the last lecture when I talked about total synthesis of progesterone by W. S. Johnson there we talked about a domino cation triggered cyclization and uh, that was uh, like biomimetic total synthesis of progesterone that was a that was a classic one and it was of academic interest. If the same strategy has to be applied for industrial production of progesterone then it will be very very expensive. So, for the industrial production of all these steroids you need much much better method and inexpensive method to synthesize. Okay. So, today we will talk about a method where progesterone, cortisone, testosterone all were synthesized on industrial scale and because of that it was inexpensive. Okay. So, how? In today's lecture I talk about synthesis of 3 steroids starting from a compound called diastenin. Okay. This is called diastenin. I will come back to that what is diastenin and where from it was isolated and how it is used in its conversion to progesterone, then cortisone, then to testosterone. As I mentioned during my introduction, when you are starting with a natural product like compound or material obtained from a natural product, which has almost all the features of the target molecule, then conversion of this natural product or natural product like molecule to the target molecule then the whole process is called semi synthesis is not it. So, here the synthesis which I am going to talk about starts with diastenin. Okay, you can see that the diastenin has the core structure of the 3 steroids which we are going to discuss today. Okay, diastenin has the core structure A B, C, D rings. Okay. All the 4 rings present in progesterone, cortisone and testosterone are there. What is not required is the, the bicyclic system, the spiroketal. Okay. The spiroketal is not required. Okay. How to get rid of the spiroketal and convert into the required side chain in progesterone, cortisone and testosterone. Okay. So, that is what we are going to discuss, but another interesting aspect about the synthesis which you are going to talk about is about industrial method, okay. how one can prepare in large quantity. Okay. And we start with the discovery of diastenin. If you look at the history of steroids, okay, 1930s were the beginning of discovery of many major steroids. In fact, 1929 was the discovery year of female sex carbon called estro. Okay. So, from 1930s to 1980s steroids played a very very important role in pharmaceutical companies. Okay. So, many drug discovery program of steroids were focused during these 6 decades and that is why we call this as you know the 1930s was called as decade of the sex hormones, but subsequently the next 50 years lot of attention was given to synthesis of uh, you know many many steroids. Many structures of other steroids were discovered in the next few, few years particularly the male sex hormone testosterone, female sex hormone as I said was discovered in 1929 and little later the pregnancy hormone uh, again related to females was uh, progesterone uh, was discovered or elucidated and later these were used as drugs. Okay. But the isolation of these 3 steroids yielded very very you know minute quantity of the natural product. So, obviously if it has to be used as drugs then it has to be synthesized prepared in large quantity. Okay. So, how this can be done? Already we talked about this total synthesis of progesterone by W. S. Johnson. Okay, that came in 1950s. Okay. 
But among these three steroids, particularly the steroid called progesterone got much attention because this had very interesting medicinal properties uh, in the treatment of menstrual disorders. Okay. So this was a serious problem uh, those days even now. So the progesterone used to be given as a drug of choice those days. So more synthetic efforts were on the synthesis of progesterone. Okay. But unfortunately, as I said, the high cost, the high cost in the preparation or synthesis of this molecule restricted its use as a drug. Okay. However, in 1940s, that the cost of progesterone fell dramatically. In 1940s, the cost of progesterone fell dramatically. And that is because of the formation of a Mexican company and how that Mexican company was formed and again how it was started from the academic laboratory. Let us discuss in the next few slides. So the person called Russell Marker was responsible for the synthesis of uh, progesterone from diastenin. So diastenin, as I said, is a naturally occurring compound. It was isolated uh, from the plant steroid called sarsaparilla. Okay. So Russell Marker, is a he was a professor from Penn State University and he was the one who correctly proposed the structure of diastenin. And he did not stop there. Okay. So what was his aim? His aim was, as I mentioned, since diastenin has the four rings present in all the steroids, his idea was, can we convert this diastenin? Okay, can we convert this diastenin into other steroids? That was his primary aim. And how to do that? First, you have to remove this side chain. Okay, the spiroketal. Okay, the spiroketal should be removed. Initially, the spiroketal was considered as inert to various reaction conditions. Okay, it was considered as inert to various reaction conditions. So, but Marker thought you can really cleave that and then he used a very clever reaction which I will come to that little later to cleave this spiroketal, okay? to cleave the spiroketal. Once you cleave that, then that opens the door for synthesis of several steroids. Okay? In 1944, I think after 6 years uh, after establishing the structure of diastenin, he first reported the really practical synthesis of progesterone. Practical means it is possible and it can be sold at affordable price from diastenin. Okay, that is very, very important. See, when we talk about academic work, when we talk about industrial work, okay, these two are different extremes, I would say. Okay, one is for academic interest. Other one, you have to keep it in mind, the whole process should be affordable. Okay, it should be inexpensive and overall costing should be affordable. Okay, so with that, this practical synthesis of progesterone from diastenin was one of the best synthesis reported for progesterone. Okay. However, as I said, he has to isolate diastenin from the plant called sarsaparilla. Okay. So that actually he could not get enough of this diastenin from this plant steroid. So that actually makes it makes the whole process little bit more expensive. So he thought it is better to look for different sources, okay, different sources to get diastenin. Suppose if we can get another plant or any other plant which gives more of diastenin, then from diastenin he can convert into progesterone. Okay, so with that, next what he did, he sent few of his you know students, uh, most of them are botanists, okay, most of them are botanists. So he asked them to search, go around South America, America, Mexico and then search for different plant source which will give more of diastenin. Okay, that was his first, first job. And second thing is, his idea was once he makes progesterone and if the process is, you know, inexpensive, then he can make other famous drugs cortisone and testosterone. Okay, so that was his idea. So idea is to develop a low cost process for progesterone and that depends on the isolation of 
diastereum in lar large quantity ok. And meanwhile he was also searching and when he was uh, going through a botany textbook he found a picture of Dioscoria ok, picture of a plant called Dioscoria and that was growing only in Mexico ok. So, he is a, he is a big professor in Penn State University, he saw that easily he could have sent one of his students to go to Mexico and get this plant. Basically in that plant the root of the plant has uh, diastereum ok and the root weighs about 100 kilos. Then you can imagine if we can get 100 kilos of this root of this plant how much he can extract diastereum and from that how much he can make progesterone. So, with all this calculation his antenna went up and from academician he became an entrepreneur ok. He thought ok it is better he himself start this process one day he went to Mexico ok. You can imagine he went to Mexico by bus ok and he talked to few people and bought two big bags with large roots of this plant ok. Two large roots of this plant he returned by the same bus. But those days you know it was not like now he put these two big bags on the top of the bus and after he crossed uh, the US border when he got down already these two bags were stolen ok. So, that used to be common those days. However, what he did he did another interesting thing he talked to a policeman and then somehow bribed and got 50 pound root ok. So, 150 pound root and with that he returned to Penn State University ok. So, he could easily isolate the diastereum in reasonably good yield ok. Then he thought ok this is the best way to isolate diastereum. Once he isolates diastereum in good quantities then he can go for the total synthesis of progesterone. So, with this idea in mind he went to the company uh, called Park Davis ok, it is a very famous company and his other research program was funded by this company. So, he went to them and then said he has developed a nice process for the synthesis of progesterone from diastereum. Now, the diastereum is available from this particular plant and this particular plant is available in Mexico. So, he wanted them to support financially so that he can develop this process and then make this in large quantity. Unfortunately, okay, unfortunately not only that company he also approached other pharma companies all of them refused to fund this project. It was surprising those days because those days the requirement for uh, progesterone and other steroids were really very high and uh, it was a big surprise that uh, pharma companies refused to fund this particular project. But as I said not only he was an academician he was also uh, you know entrepreneur he thought why, why we have to talk to companies why not he himself can do it ok. So, he, he, he became an entrepreneur as well as academician. So, he thought he will do it himself. This time he went to Mexico but he was careful and what he did he talked to a small local small scale extractor ok. So, somebody who can do this job he talked to that person first then he collected 10 tons of that root ok 10 tons you can imagine ok. He gave this 10 tons to this uh, local uh, local person and asked him you extract this root with alcohol ok. Then remove the alcohol and give only the syrup ok. That person agreed and it is like you know uh, uh, when, you, when you start a small industry what you do you give certain percentage of share to that uh, person is not it. So, what he did when the alcohol was evaporated he got syrup one third of the syrup he gave it to that person who actually extracted. The remaining two third he brought it to New York ok. With this two third he got 80 kilos of progesterone with two third of uh, you know whatever syrup he brought to New York he made 80 kilos of progesterone. Then he sold one gram of progesterone for 80 dollars, 1 gram of progesterone for 80 dollars. 
now you imagine now you imagine how much money he made 1 gram cost 80 dollars 80 kilos how much it is that is the real you know entrepreneurship in him when he was an academician so this is very important not many academicians will like to become an entrepreneur but at the same time this is a classical example when he realized that you know there is a possibility that he could be a successful entrepreneur he moved ahead and then took the risk and then he became a successful entrepreneur okay and he did not stop there so he thought okay we can he, he could make 80 kilos for the sustained development for the sustained development and sustained supply of progesterone it's better to form a company isn't it then while thinking about forming a company where to form the company because this is also very important whether you want to form a company in us or you want to form the company in mexico always you know if you are an entrepreneur, entrepreneur you, you know very well it is better to form a company where your raw materials are available okay from a chemical company's point of view when logistics used to be a problem it's always better to start a company where raw materials are available so he decided immediately that he will form the company in mexico so he talked to two more uh, young dynamic entrepreneurs from mexico called somlo and lehman okay then as usual you know they have to sign an agreement for profit sharing so they signed an agreement then they formed a company called syntax they formed a company called syntax so with this company they started producing progesterone okay but in when you form a company with more people okay there is always a risk of you know getting into some trouble okay so in 1944 marker did not get along well with these two entrepreneurs okay there was always you know profit sharing problem okay then he had to come out of the company but before that what he did what marker did he saw that syntax will take off very well so he resigned from penn state university okay academic position he resigned academic position he resigned and moved to syntax he thought no syntax will be a good option he can he can sell and he can make a lot of profit okay and also in the process you can see he could sell progesterone for 50 dollars earlier he was selling progesterone for 80 dollars per gram now since this company was formed in the place where the roots are available so the raw material cost everything came down so he could sell the progesterone for 50 dollars per gram but as i said a year later uh, there was a problem and profit sharing is uh, you know uh, as, as affected marker and then he thought okay why why to st stick with the company but interestingly one should know this is very common at least this used to be very common um, at, until you know 10 15 years ago in process division once you have the know how once you have the process of know how many people don't disclose many people don't disclose how to carry out the reactions marker cleverly what he did he used coding he used coding all the reagents so his partners did not know which reagent he was using which reaction he was doing they only know they only funded they only know that he is responsible for the chemistry and they have funded and overall once they sell they will share the profit but they did not know the real chemistry okay when as i said when there was a profit sharing marker has to leave the company when he left the company he just took the process because he himself did all the chemistry so others just could not repeat the process so what marker did he went out and started a another company called botanica max okay so he also got supply of regular supply of the uh, roots from others and with that he started a company botanica max and that company was you know supplying progesterone and he remained in that company until retirement meanwhile 
the other two entrepreneurs okay who started the company syntax along with marker so they saw the potential of this process but they did they did not have a person like marker so what they did they approached they approached many people many scientists who can think of this process so by now they know what is the starting material diazine so they wanted to know somebody who can do the same process and then synthesize progesterone in large quantity so they appointed a person called george rosengrantz okay and who did lot of you know optimization and revived the work and he could start making progesterone and that's how syntax was really you know again back to business in making progesterone and not only that this person this chemist he extended this work okay once he made the progesterone the progesterone was converted into cortisone and testosterone okay and syntax later they also collaborated with a very famous uh, uh, chemist uh, called carl jarasi was well known for mass spectrometry and then his work on steroid particularly or on oral contraceptive so they collaborated with carl jarasi and carl, carl jarasi was responsible for converting diazgen into cortisone and cortisone to testosterone and so on okay that time before carl jarasi used this uh, method to make cortisone the merck company was taking about 36 steps to synthesize cortisone okay cortisone is one of the you know famous steroids being used now but you can imagine if it has to take 36 steps to make cortisone then it will be very difficult for you know common people to buy this cortisone okay so that is how this particular strategy was very very important to make cartisone in affordable method. Meanwhile, the Ubjan company made a major breakthrough, major breakthrough in oxidizing, oxidizing progesterone. See, if you look at the progesterone and if you look at cartisone, you can see there is a hydroxyl group oxygenated, uh, oxygenated at C ring. Okay, the C ring hydroxylation was done by this microbiological process. So, because of that, so you don't have to go through chemical process to introduce the hydroxyl group. So this microbiological process reduced significantly the number of steps involved in the conversion of progesterone to cortisone. Okay, so now let us go to the chemistry. How marker actually converted diastenine to progesterone and later progesterone to cortisone and testosterone. So this is diastenine. And as I said, the first step is the removal of the spiroketal side chain. So what he did, he reflects this diazgenin in large quantity, one can do it in ton, tons also, in acetic hydride at 200 degrees, okay. At 200 degrees, you reflex with acetic hydride, this cleaves and you get, you can see, see this is uh, acetic hydride and then this lone pair. and this becomes OAC and followed by loss of proton, you get the corresponding enol ether. Okay. Now, if you treat with chromium trioxide, if you treat with chromium trioxide, this cleaves, okay, oxygenation followed by cleavage of this double bond, one gets the acetyl group. Okay. You can see this is what you need, this is what you need in progesterone and your free hydroxyl was also acetylated in the first step. Now what you need is you need to remove this long chain, okay? remove this long chain. So this can be done by treatment with acetic acid. So when you do acetic acid, so hydrolysis of this ester takes place followed by dehydration gives this compound, gives this compound. Okay? Now this is a very important intermediate. This is a very, very important intermediate in steroids. This is called 16 DPA. What is 16 DPA? It is called 16 dehydropregnenolone acetate. So this is a very important intermediate for synthesis of several steroids that was obtained from diastenin in three steps, okay, using simple reagents. Once you have 16 DPA, then one can selectively hydrogenate the CD double bond. Okay. 
So once you do that, then you get the beta acetyl group, then hydrolysis, the acetate group is hydrolyzed with potassium hydroxide to get the corresponding o OH. Now if you oxidize, now if you oxidize, not only the hydroxyl group gets oxidized, then the double bond also migrates that is nothing but progesterone. So if you look at the whole process, basically in 6 steps, in 6 steps one can convert diastinine to progesterone, all using very very simple reagents, commercially available inexpensive reagents to make progesterone. That is how Marker used this method to make you know tons of progesterone. Okay. Now how 16 DPA which is the intermediate, okay, which is the intermediate in the synthesis of progesterone from diastinone to convert into cortisone. Okay, this is 16 DPA. Okay. First you make epoxide of this double bond, alpha, beta and such a ketone. So if you treat with alkaline hydrogen peroxide that will selectively epoxidize alpha, beta and saturated ketone. So you make the epoxide, it is a stereoselective epoxidation, the epoxide comes from the alpha side. Now if you treat with HBr, it opens up, so you get the tertiary alcohol and the beta bromide. And meanwhile when you treat with acetic anhydride, the free hydroxyl group gets acetylated. Okay. Having done that, next you treat with HI, so HI you know gives uh, this bromide SN2 like displacement to give corresponding iodide and then nane nickel removes the iodide. Okay. So what you have done basically the epoxide you open and then you have done the reductive removal of the halide. Okay. Now as I said you need to introduce a hydroxyl group here and also a hydroxyl group in the series. So this is where the Merck's process, the microbial hydroxylation took place at this position, very important transformation. So once you do that, it does two things, what are they? One, the hydroxylation here and hydroxylation here, two hydroxylation, okay. The dihydroxylation actually helped, okay, reducing lot of chemical wastes. Now potassium hydroxide will hydrolyze the acetate to alcohol then chromium trioxide will oxidize that, that alcohol as well as this secondary alcohol in serine to give ketone and, and also the double bond will migrate. So that is nothing but cortisone. Again you see from 16 DPA to cortisone in few steps and one of them is a microbial dihydroxylation. Okay, that is the key step in the conversion of 16 DPA to cortisone. Then the same 16 DPA was successfully used to convert into testosterone, male sex hormone. How? Same in 16 dPa, now you treat with hydroxylamine. So when you treat with hydroxylamine, you have a ketone and that will immediately form an oxide. Okay. When you have an oxide, the next reaction which should come to your mind is Beckman rearrangement. Okay. So Beckman rearrangement on treatment with paratoluene sulfonyl chloride and then acid. So you can see this, this will give you this corresponding amide, okay, corresponding amide. Once you have this amide, now this is enamide, isn't it? This is enamide, that enamide can get hydrolyzed to give corresponding ketone, enamide gets hydrolyzed to the corresponding ketone. So now from here testosterone was done in two steps, first you hydrolyze the acetate to alcohol, then you oxidize, you see you get the corresponding in diome, the 5 membered ketone reduced to alcohol. Okay. So selectively one can reduce the 5 membered ketone with sodium borohydride to get testosterone. So if you look at the whole process, the whole process dependent on marker's degradation step. So marker cleverly used a 6 step process to convert diastinine which is available from uh, roots of you know Mexican plant to make 16 DPA in 3 steps and in 6 steps he converted that uh, 
diastenin into progesterone. From 16 dPa you can convert that into testosterone and cortisone. Okay. So, all this started with the clever use of oxidation of diastenin to 16 dPa. Okay. So, I will stop here, we will continue our discussion on synthesis of steroids in the next class. Thank you.